Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and organizations, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understandings from neuroscience, anthropology, history, and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Garrick Jones. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage, and today I'm here with one of my co-authors, Paul Ashcroft. Hello. And we're delighted to be joined by Christian Buch. Christian is a friend of mine from the London School of Economics, and he's an academic at the New York University, NYU, and he's author of The Serendipity Mindset, The Art and Science of Creating Good Luck. Welcome to The Curious Advantage podcast, Christian. Thank you so much for having me. Christian, hi. You've spent a decade exploring how we can use uncertainty as a pathway to more joyful, purposeful, and successful lives. We're curious to find out more. Could you start us off by uh, telling our listeners a little about yourself and what serendipity means to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I had an experience early on in life, in my late teenage years, that made me realize how quickly life can be over. So kind of a near-death experience type car crash. And it put me on this intense search for meaning where I asked all these questions around, you know, if I wouldn't be here anymore, would it have been worth it? And, you know, did it do anything meaningful so far? And at that point, I had to answer those questions with a very clear no. And so I started reading all these books, you know, Viktor Frankl's Search for Meaning and, and other books and trying to figure out how do I kind of find meaning in this in this world. And um, so it led me a little bit into community building. And um, I was involved in setting up a community called Sandbox, which brings together young innovators around the world and helps them make ideas happen. And one of the things that popped up all the time there was that people at dinners or so would say, oh my God, such a coincidence, such a coincidence, such a coincidence. And so I got very excited about this question of how do we accelerate this kind of coincidence that um, seems to happen here all the time. And so um, that really kind of led me more and more into um, the question of how do we cultivate these kind of unexpected encounters that lead to positive outcomes, which, which serendipity really um, is to me. And then what I found fascinating is, you know, in parallel to those kind of practical experiences, I went into academia to understand a bit more, how do we scale social impact? How do we develop networks more effectively and so on? And to my delight, serendipity popped up everywhere I went. I mean, a lot of my work is in sub-Saharan Africa. The most joyful, purpose-driven, successful leaders there had a lot in common with the CEOs of MasterCard or others, which all in a way intuitively cultivated serendipity. And so I've become extremely curious about the question of what are the patterns behind this? So what can we learn from all these successful, interesting people about how we can set ourselves up for the unexpected? And so that's really what that work has been about. Right. And it's fascinating to hear how you've seen serendipity at work across all these different domains. How would you define what serendipity is? Is it just about coincidence or is there more to it than that it's a great question because i look at it in a way as as kind of smart luck as active luck uh, as opposed to the kind of blind luck that just happens to us i mean blind luck would be something like you know being born into a good family or something and like you're not working for it it just just happens it's just an event versus smart luck serendipity is all about saying there is something happening, something unexpected. You know, this kind of moment where you run into someone in a coffee shop or you meet someone at a conference, but it's not enough to just have that kind of encounter. You need to do something with it. You need to connect the dots. You need to somehow strike up a conversation related to something else. And that essentially then becomes serendipity, this kind of process of collecting or spotting and connecting the dots. And really um, that kind of active element I find so interesting because it allows us to then say, okay, there are proactive things we can do in our lives, how we can see the unexpected more, so how we can collect the dots, but also how we then can do something with it, so, so how we can connect the dots. Christian, you talked about the patterns behind serendipity. How do these play out in reality and in organizations, for example? Yeah, it's really something. So over the last years, we've mapped a lot of the kind of serendipitous um, processes that that happen across organizations and one of the things i found fascinating is that there's always something you know unexpected of course like so take the example of um a chinese company they they produce white goods uh, mostly washing machines and refrigerators and they got farmers call them up and and the farmers would be like hey look 
we're trying to wash our potatoes in your washing machine, but it always breaks down. And so what would we usually do? We would say, well, it's unexpected that they do that, but let's quote unquote educate them to not wash their potatoes in a clothing washing machine. They did the opposite. They said, okay, this is unexpected, but you know what? There's a lot of farmers out there who might have similar problems. And so essentially they built in a dirt filter and made it a potato washing machine. Um, the same with examples, everything from Viagra to um, you know, how you met the love of your life in the coffee shop, like these kind of examples all have in common that there is this kind of unexpected thing happening, like a farmer calling up or in the case of Viagra, you know, they tried another medication, they realized, oh, there's some kind of movement in the trousers of male participants happening. That was unexpected, but then they connected it to the problem that a lot of men have that idea of not, you know, having movement in that department and come up with, came up with Viagra. So it's always this kind of unexpected moment, but then doing something about it. And so in companies, something I've been really curious about is what are rituals or practices that we can introduce that allow us to have more of this happen? So to give an example, one, one example that some companies have adopted is to say, let's do post-mortems or project funerals, where essentially, you know, usually when an idea or a project doesn't work out in a company, we try to hide it, right? We try to say, oh, it, it never really happened. And, and we hope that everyone forgets about it very quickly. The problem with this, of course, is that we re never really learn from it and that, that we don't build that kind of environment of trust where it's okay to not have it all figured out. And so uh, that practice is about the opposite. It's about saying, okay, if a certain idea doesn't work out, instead of burying it and nobody sees it, we do a funeral where in front of other people from the organization, you know, that could be people from other divisions or it could be people from other departments, and we lay it to rest in front of them and we talk about what we learn from that. And so it's not about celebrating failure, it's about celebrating the learning from the failure. And so in one example, there would be a, you know, a company, a Dutch company uh, that developed this uh, beautiful technology that would allow to not reflect the light when it comes to a window. And, you know, it's a, it's a great technology, but they underestimated that there's no real market for it. And so essentially they laid it to rest. They said, hey, look, next time we will understand a bit better what the market actually wants. Now, someone in the audience, you know, puts their hand up excitedly and says, well, have you considered what this would mean for solar? Have you considered if we would take that technology and put it into, you know, a solar kind of based um, apparatus, how much energy that would absorb and, and help us to gain? And that is how part of their solar division emerged. It was completely serendipitous. It was very lucky that it happened. But because they had created a ritual that allowed them to connect the dots, that allowed them to put something out there where other people could be like, oh my God, like this could actually fit into my setting. It could fit into my environment. Um, by doing that, they made it more probable that serendipity would happen. So it's really about upping the probability that serendipity happens through the, the rituals and practices that you could build in as part of the culture of the organization. I remember the great work you did and have done on the Sandbox Network, which was amazing. Incredible network of young people meeting together and, and it generated huge amounts of outcomes, I think. Those were physical get-togethers that were generating all of this energy. But what does serendipity mean for us now in the digital age? And I'm, right now we're experiencing the lockdown uh, due to the coronavirus, but I mean, in the digital age, how can we ensure those practices and those rituals and those things can continue in a way that we used to do when we get together physically? That's a great question because, in a way, when I think about technology and the virtual, uh, in an ideal world, I would see it as an extension that just helps us to translate some of these processes in, in other ways. So, for example, if you think about one of the things that Sandbox, that we try to reinforce in Sandbox early on, was the way how we ask questions. And, you know, in a physical setting, that would be something like bringing people to a dinner in an extremely informal environment and then having them let their guard down and then have them talk about questions such as, you know, what is on your mind? What challenges are you going through? And the beauty of these kind of questions is that they open up this opportunity spectrum where people could be like, oh, my God, such a coincidence. I, I just went through a transition like this or X, Y, Z. And so the thing here is that, of course, we can translate something like this also into online. It, it might feel a bit stiffer at the beginning, but I think there's more and more platforms that like, you know, even like house party or, or other type of platforms that allow us to, in a more informal environment, try to connect with people. And I think that the, the kind of questions we can ask in those environments or the kind of um, 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 statements we make are actually quite similar. So to give you an example, you know, let's say you're at a kind of virtual conference. I just came from a virtual conference 
um, from another continent. I guess that's the beauty at the moment, not that you can go from continent to continent uh, within 10 minutes, um, which probably um, is, is, is wonderful in terms of scalability of, of ideas and, and content. You know, there, for example, uh, you know, it was a relatively small group. So the organizers said, OK, what do you do? Introduce yourselves briefly. And so the problem, of course, with the what do you do question, uh, both to a room of people, but also, you know, in our one on one conversations at virtual conferences or so, is that it puts people into a box, right? It essentially says, OK, great, like I'm in education, I'm in this. And so the opportunity spectrum there is relatively like, you know, narrow. But uh, what Ollie Barrett, uh, a friend of mine, you might know, he's he's a wonderful entrepreneur in London. And if you would ask him, what do you do? He would say, well, you know, I am I set up an education venture. I recently started exploring philosophy, but what I really enjoy doing is playing the piano. And so what he did here is he gives you three potential hooks. He gives you three potential touch points where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. I just started a philosophy XYZ setting, uh, you know, reading session. Uh, do you want to join? Or... Such a coincidence, I just started hosting matinees and we should have you as a piano player. Whatever it is, the point is that in a way what he does here is he puts potential dots out there that we can connect for him. And I think this kind of, in a way, in a virtual environment stays quite similar. It's just we, we have different types of platforms that allow us to, to do that. But long story short, I feel like at the, at the core of uh, virtual serendipity as well is the way we ask questions, the way we interact with each other. Yeah. And essentially technology can, you know, the way it's structured can make that maybe a bit more intimate, yeah. but it, it still leaves it to us in terms of our own ag agency in that. Christian, do you have a list of some of the other questions that we should consider asking to keep things open and be serendipitous? Yeah, I'm a big fan. I mean, it depends, of course, um, in which setting we are, right? So if we're, if we just met someone uh, at a conference, I would always do something around, um, you know, what did you find most interesting about the last talk or, you know, what struck you in this conversation or, you know, something that in a way um, allows the other person to pick whatever they feel most comfortable and they can just talk about it. If we're in a more intimate setting, so let's say it's already an existing community, we could go a bit deeper, right? We could ask something like what makes you come alive at the moment or what excites you the most at the moment or what was your favorite book recently? Or just things that allow us to essentially say, let them pick whatever they are most excited about rather than just asking them about how was your trip or how's your daughter, which of course is important, but it doesn't really give us that kind of idea of what's really on their mind. And I think every question that brings out what's really on their mind is very powerful because these kind of motivations that, that then come out tell us a lot about the other person, but also it gives us an indication which path we should go down for our follow-up questions. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. Christian, this is a conversation all about curiosity as well. And does curiosity create advantage? Just like, as I think you're saying, serendipity can be used to personal advantage or to the advantage of organizations. And I was fascinated about some of the overlaps that maybe you see between curiosity and serendipity. I mean, one of the things that I've taken away from what you've said so far is about how serendipity is not some completely unquantifiable thing, but in some way you can shape it or maybe form a process in terms of connecting the dots. And in our research on curiosity, we found a similar thing, that curiosity in some way, not a process, but it's something that you can learn as a skill, like a muscle that you can work out and improve on. Do you see something similar with serendipity and how how does that link with curiosity? Definitely. So when thinking about the the kind of building the serendipity muzzle, one key component is is around that question of how do we develop an open mind, right? How do we develop that kind of deeper curiosity that allows us to essentially see new dots, but also see how dots could be connected differently? Because uh, serendipity at the end of the day is all about making accidents meaningful or making more meaningful accidents. And, and so it's kind of really about that needs us to be open to the world. And so to give an example, we, we did a study recently with uh, 31 uh, CEOs of big multinational companies, MasterCard, Procter & Gamble and others who all want to go into integrating more profit and purpose. And so we sat down with them and we said, OK, hey. Um, what is it about your leadership style that really seems to work? And one thing, one one underlying pattern that came out of it is that they all seem to ask why all the time. They all seem to question all the time. Like it's it's almost like practical philosophers. They constantly question assumptions. They're constantly 
asking why is something working the way it works. And that is actually something when you think about something like serendipity, where it's all about essentially opening up that space of potential associations, of potential interactions. If you ask why, what you're doing is you're stepping back from a particular solution or a particular problem and, and really open up that space. And so to give you an example, if you are uh, in a company context, if you are a company like Philips, what you usually do is you define your departments in terms of uh, the solution, right? So you would call it a tomography department or a printer department in, in other companies or whatever it is. The point here is, of course, that what the, the problem is, the assumption here is that that solution is the one solution that exists. So you're just improving that solution. So it, it restricts your opportunity space. But if you're stepping back and say, what's the actual problem we're solving here? In, in the case of tomography, for example, maybe we're, we're solving the problem of precision diagnosis. Tomography is one way to do that, but you know what? Like there's there's tons of other ways. And so if you would rename now that department into precision diagnosis department, then people could come up with solutions that are completely different. So what you're doing here on a corporate level is what we can do on the individual level, which is constantly asking, why do we assume that XYZ is true? Why do we assume XYZ solution is true? And, and that really goes back to, you know, even like the Socrates types like uh, questions, right? Back in the days around... Um, you know, why would we think that something is true? And so I think, um, yeah. you know, the role of curiosity is huge in terms of how we, um, and, and as, a, as a big fan of The Little Prince, you know, um, who, who the, this beautiful book um, where The Little Prince asks all these different questions, I feel it's powerful also because, you know, I've seen it in my own journey with the book, like um, of, of constantly redefining success also, right? Constantly redefining why do I believe that I'm what I'm writing about here is relevant? Why do I believe X, Y, Z? And that in a way then rubber stems us forward towards, towards interesting things. Just to continue that thought and to extend it into one of the other concepts you bring up in your book around dumb luck and is luck really dumb? When we were talking to people about the fact that we're writing about curiosity, the first response is almost always, oh, curiosity killed the cat. What we found is that everybody generally is curious, but as they get older, perhaps, or learn through their experience in life, that curiosity doesn't always help them. What's been your experience of putting serendipity to work in your life to maybe give luck a hand, let's say, in the same way that curiosity is something you don't just try and hope it works out, but you also have to work at? One of the major challenges that I've seen with people who cultivate a lot of serendipity, so people who practice some of those kind of things we talked about, right, in terms of how they ask questions, how they reframe situations, how they do rituals such as these project funerals. And one of the key challenges, of course, is what is the filter in terms of how do we make sure that in a world that is so full of distractions, and you know someone like me, I mean, I love serendipity. And, you know, in the process of writing the book, I had a lot of serendipity happen. But at some point, I was just like, look, I got to stay now in a coffee shop and put my head down and just get that book done and not be distracted by additional serendipity. And so one of the key uh, things that I've seen um, that, that are really successful in that case is also to say, OK, let's build in a good filter that allows us to only have those accidents being meaningful that that truly have like moved the needle for our own lives. And one thing that I've seen in, in our work is that if you look at those successful leaders we studied, for example, they essentially have a certain kind of deeper North Star or purpose or principle, or even like curiosity, or even kind of just something that is almost a guiding principle for them. And that allows them then to filter. Like if you take someone like Paul Pullman, the, the former Unilever CEO, if you would go to him, uh, essentially, he had a very clear or he has a very clear North Star, right? He says, if you come to me with an idea, it has to fit into, I want to build platforms that enable others to help themselves. And so my idea now, if I run into him at an event and I pitch him an idea and it's an unexpected, nice kind of thing um, for, for both of us, um, it has to fit into that kind of North Star that he has. If it doesn't, it, he, he filters it. And so essentially, I think that kind of ability then to have some kind of sense of direction, but at the same time, be open to the unexpected, a lot of times help guide, helps guide us. Mm -hmm. But also there's these kind of other things we, we can do, right? In terms of, I mean, I, for example, I have a serendipity journal where I write down things like, okay, these are the couple of things I did today or that were serendipitous. And this is what I can learn from them. And this is where I can see my active uh, element in that. And so when you look at this, you know, if you if you think about how much of this is, is almost like self-fulfilling prophecy, there's one study, for example, or one experiment where they took one person who self-identifies as extremely lucky and one person who self-identifies as extremely unlucky. 
And essentially the question was, when you do that, so when you prime yourself, how much, how much more luck do you have because you believe you can have the luck and because you open your eyes to it? And so they essentially told the two people, okay, walk down the street, I mean, independently, walk down the street, go into the coffee shop, order a coffee, sit down, that's it. And what they didn't tell them is that they put a five pound note in front of the coffee shop door. Uh, there's hidden cameras in the coffee shop and along the street. And in the coffee shop, there's only one empty seat. And that seat is next to this extremely successful businessman who can make all dreams happen. And so now the lucky person walks down the street, sees the five pound note, picks it up, goes inside the coffee shop, orders the coffee, sits down next to the businessman. That's the one empty seat, has a wonderful conversation, exchanges business cards, we don't know if, a, if an opportunity comes out of it, but of course it wouldn't be unexpected, right? Now, the unlucky person walks down the street, steps over the five pound note, goes inside the shop, orders the coffee, also sits next to the successful businessman. That's the only seat that's, that's free, ignores the businessman, and that's it. Now, at the end of the day, they ask both people, so how was your day? And, you know, the successful person, uh, the lucky person says, well, well, it was great. You know, I made two new friends. I found money in the streets. And, you know, we don't know if an opportunity came out of it, but might well be. The unlucky person just says, well, nothing really happened. And, you know, we've seen that in a lot of our work, you can put people into exactly the same situation and they come out with very, very different outcomes in terms of serendipitous outcomes, in terms of how open they are, but also how much they believe they can create their own smart luck. A curious culture is a game changer. What does curiosity mean for you? Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. You know, in our research, Christian, on curiosity, one of the key things we discovered was the value of community. And that kind of came out, if you want are curious about something, it's different to, to being just wondering what something's about. If you're truly curious about something, it's active. Uh, if you want to learn jazz music, for example, you need to connect with a network of jazz musicians. You need to connect with people who've been there so they can lead you in, teach you the language, um, guide you through uh, what you need to learn. You know, there's a whole community, a whole um, ecosystem that relates to jazz music. Community is powerful in every single context, we think. It's coming back to Sandbox and the other networks you've created, which are really amazing communities. What do you think the secret is to creating like powerful, serendipitous networks, especially now in the digital age? You know, one thing that I've realized in the years of building communities is that there's a lot of networks out there. So there's a lot of kind of people who somehow connect with each other on Twitter, on Facebook, and so on. But these connections are not really strong. And so they are not really kind of, um, you know, that, that deeply meaningful. And if you think about strong communities in a way, the ones that I've seen being really kind of strongly serendipitous are the ones that where you almost combine weak ties with strong ties. So where you, in a way, have those people you don't know that well, but they care enough to essentially make something happen with you. And, and they might do that because they have proxy trust. So they might do that because you're affiliated with the same community that, that really means something to them um, or because they have a mutual friend that is a really good friend or or whatever it is. And one of the things that um, I found fascinating when building communities is really that question of like, what is it that really allows people to, to have those meaningful interactions that lead to that kind of spark? Uh, if you think about serendipity, a lot of it is about our kind of base potential for serendipity. So how do we essentially, what allows us to have serendipity? And serendipity is such a collaborative process a lot of times that we need that kind of in a way, people who are around us who are diverse enough to plug into different areas a lot of times or who might have different types of personalities and then help us to reflect on things. So, for example, if you are an extrovert type person and you're out there and you have a lot of serendipity happening, you might need that kind of introvert type person who helps you ground those things and reflect on those things and really filter those kind of serendipity encounters that make sense. Um, but more broadly with communities, something that we found very valuable is to think about what makes groups in a way have a certain common denominator. So uh, values that are aligned uh, or others, other things that really ground someone and makes them care about the other person, but at the same time diverse enough so that they really kind of can plug into different areas. And so in a way, really this idea of, of using weak ties as, as if they were strong ties, if, as, as Fabian Fortmiller would say. So it's um, so community is really being at the core of, of a lot of those kind of uh, things. Christian, it's been brilliant to talk to you and I've really enjoyed learning about the crossover and the connection between serendipity and curiosity. There seems to be quite an overlap between those two concepts. 
You've given us so many ideas and insights today. If there is one thing you wanted our listeners to take away from today's podcast, what would that be? Being German, I have a philosophical side and the philosopher in me sees serendipity as the most beautiful path towards potentiality. So if you think about it that way, that in a way, when you're working in a company or you're living your life, you're living your life according to something you ended up in some kind of box at some point, right? But like you could be so many different people and you could do so many different things. And so the question becomes, how do we develop platforms being that companies, communities that allow us to become our best self or at least the most aligned self? And so serendipity is beautiful because in a way, nobody tells us X, Y, Z is the plan that you have to figure out. But serendipity in a way allows us to have moments that can lead us into directions that we can then choose so to, to pick up. And so I think the, the most beautiful thing about serendipity is it really can give us this enthusiasm for life back in, in situations like at the moment where everything feels uncertain. But, you know, like then once we let go from this idea that we all have to go to Rome, um, we realize that, you know what, like there's much more beautiful paths that emerge serendipitously once we reframe crisis into opportunity. For me, I'm taking away serendipity, the most beautiful path to potentiality. It's poetry. Um, it's fantastic <laughs> to talk to you, as always. Unfortunately, we have to bring this to an end. I really look forward to continuing the conversation with you, as always. Thank you so much for joining us, Christian. Thank you so much for having me. Everybody, please go and get a copy of Christian's book, The Serendipity Mindset, The Art and Science of Creating Good Luck. Thank you for listening to The Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Subscribe to the podcast today. Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.